What's up, my wizards? It's Dev and Ziggy here from SBMTG. We like it a magic. Missed you over the weekend. You miss us. We missed you. Seriously. But anyway, a lot to talk about today. i got to catch you up on the spoilers that trickled out over the weekend. Not a whole lot of stuff, but some things worth talking about. And then today, got a whole fresh batch of cookies from the oven. Some of it's limited stuff that's actually kind of impressive. But there are some standard and even modern nuggets in there, too. So, a lot to discuss. It's best that we jump right in. We're going to start off today with some pretty calm stuff from over the weekend. A couple of artifact creatures with Adamant. Here's Clockwork Servant and Hinge Walker. Both of these are okay, so long as you can get the Adamant bonus. Otherwise, they're just not that good at all. Servant is a 3-mana 2-3 gnome. Do love the creature type and the art. It's like sort of off-putting. It looks like it's from a tool video. And when it enters the battlefield, if at least 3 mana of the same color was spent to cast it, you draw a card. So a 3-mana 2-3 draw card that any deck in Limited can play, so long as it's heavy into one color or even just monocolored, is actually really good, but a 3-mana 2-3 do nothing, not so great. So you pretty much have to hit the adamant bonus on this. But again, if you're in a deck that's really heavy into one color or just straight up monocolored and limited, if you can pull it off, this is actually a really good piece to consider to fill out your curve. Same thing with Hinge Walker. If you do get the adamant bonus on this, just the same way you get it with Servant, just 3 mana of the same color, doesn't matter what color, then this basically becomes a 3 mana 3-3, a Centaur Courser, and that... It's actually pretty decent stats and limited, especially given that any deck can play it. But a 3-mana 2-2 two, two is a Skate Zombies, and nobody wants that garbage. We also got to see the rest of the Jack and the Beanstalk story play out in cardboard form for some reason. Here's Bartered Cow, Giant Opportunity, and Tall as a Beanstalk. Now, T as a B is 4-mana, 3, and a green for an enchantment. It's an Aura, Chance of Creature. And the enchanted creature gets plus 3, plus 3, has reach, and is a giant in addition to its other types. I don't really like creature enchantments in Limited, so I can't really say I'm a huge fan of this. The other two cards are a little bit better, though. Like, Bartered Cow is at least a comedy card. It serves its function as that, but it's kind of interesting. Interesting. It's four mana for a three three hill hill giant stats. The creature type is ox here, and when bartered cow dies or when you discard it, create a food token. I am really interested in that when you discard it clause. That could go with like burglar rat or any rummage effects like Sarkin's um, plus one on the three mana Sarkin, or the litany of rummage effects we've already seen in this set. We'll see one a little bit later on in this video. So I do like the ancillary value that you get on this when you discard it, and there's probably a couple of cool janky ways to, you know, enable that part of the text. But even if you can discard this, it's just all it does is give you a food token, big deal. But when it dies, getting a food token, kind of cool too, especially in the limited environment, because this will block, and since it's got relatively high stats, it'll often trade with the creature that it's blocking, and it leaves you behind a way to gain three more life. So this is a really defensive card when you think about it. And I already don't mind the stats as it is. You know, especially in a game of Sealed, much more so than Draft. In a game of Sealed, Hill Giant stats are at least playable. And the extra value is really nice. But Giant Opportunity is easily the best of these three Jack and the Beanstalk cards, at least to my mind. I really like this. It's three mana for a sorcery. You may sacrifice two foods. If you do, create a 7-7 seven, seven green giant creature token. Otherwise, you just create three food tokens. Now, I think this is probably just decent in the limited environment, especially in draft in the food deck if you're trying to draft it up. But this could be a playable three drop in the standard food deck where it's fairly easy to create two food tokens by turn three. I could see that happening, but I'm not really sure that it makes it into standard, especially when we have Teferi and Tyrant Scorn and a bunch of other cards that can easily deal with this, the token that this makes. And the token doesn't even have Trample or anything. Again, 7-7 seven, seven on turns 3 sounds really, really good, but I'm just I'm not quite sure. But this having a couple of different modes might push it into standard playability in that food deck, but let me just put it this way. This isn't making the food deck look a whole lot better to me. But on to today for now, because I'm going to talk about some more limited stuff that we saw. We saw a cycle of adventure creatures, and these just look better and better, especially in the limited environment, like Lonesome Unicorn and Twinvale Treevoke and Silver Flame Squire especially. But let me go over these one by one real quick. Twinvale Treevoke is a six mana, five and a green for a six five. But Oaken Boon is the adventure half of it. For four mana, you get a sorcery. Put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. Just a nice little bread and butter creature in the limited environment especially again in sealed slower formats like sealed this is actually a really nice looking card you get to make one of your smaller creatures a little bit bigger on turn four turn five something like that and then later on in the game you just get a huge creature lots to like about this card same thing with loathsome unicorn you could even say it might be 
the last unicorn. This is five mana, four and a white for a three three vigilance. But the spell half of this is really, really difficult to read because it's white on white. Rider in need, three mana, two and a white for a sorcery, create a two two white knight creature token with vigilance. So for eight mana in total, you get five five worth of vigilance stats on two creatures, which isn't terrible considering you split the cost up between a couple of turns. Cards like this just make it look to me as though like creature decks in limited are just going to have all the gas that they need we really haven't seen like that much incredible removal in this set at least up to this point there's been a few good cards and some important role players in limited don't get me wrong there's been some stuff but for cards like this there just don't look to be that many answers this effectively puts two creatures into play for you and even though their stats aren't that huge and vigilance isn't the most impressive ability the sort of you know, consistency a card like this can bring you. The board presence a card like this can bring you is really nice. It's kind of effectively a two-for-one um, on a card. You know, you don't get to affect your opponent's side of the board or anything, but you do get two creatures on one card, and that's often very, very nice. I expect this to be a playable sort of limited role player. But speaking of limited role players, I think easily the best of these cards is Silver Flame Squire. This is a 2 mana 2 one that doesn't have any text on the creature half, but the spell half is on alert. This is 3 mana, 2 and a white for an instant, and target creature gets plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn, and you untap it. That is the kind of combat trick you'd probably play anyway, maybe not at a 3 mana rate. It's a relatively high rate for this combat trick, but it's still the kind of combat trick that's going to make sure that one of your creatures survives in combat. You even get to attack with that creature and then untap it to block. Survive in combat and kill the creature that it's blocking. And then, a turn or two later, you get a body. That is really, really good. This, again, functions as effectively a two-for-one if you can kill a creature on blocks with a combat trick and then play the creature from exile like the next turn. And cards like that are really, really good, especially in these aggressive limited decks. You want to play combat tricks anyway, so why not play a combat trick that's also a creature? But that's not the only new mechanic that got showcased today. We saw a couple of more adamant cards, too, this morning. Arden Veil vale Paladin and Rally for the Throne. Paladin is four mana, three and a white for a 2-5 human knight. And if at least three white mana was spent to cast it, it ETBs with a plus one, plus one counter on it. So a four mana, three, six is actually really good. But unlike some of these other adamant cards, I don't actually mind the stats on this too much, even if he can't get adamant. A four mana, two, five isn't that much to write home about, but five toughness is always pretty decent and limited. It's going to block a lot of stuff and survive, and it's going to block most early game creatures, survive, and kill them. And a 4 mana rate is actually not so bad for that. But, if you can't get the 4 mana 3-6, that stats all day. That is very good for the mana cost. So... I like this, but the card that I'm even more interested in is Rally for the Throne. This is three mana, two and a white for an instant to create two one one white human creature tokens. But if you spent three mana, three white mana to cast this spell, if all of the mana you spent to cast it was white, then you gain one life for each creature you control. When I first saw this, I was not super impressed, but the more I think about it, the more I like it, because the context I'm putting it in, in my mind, is if it were a three mana... 2-2 two, two with flash that could block an additional creature each combat, that would be pretty good already, but if it had all those stats and it also gained you at least two life when it ETB'd, that'd be a playable creature, at least in limited and maybe even in standard. So, again, the more I think about this, the more I kind of like it. I always have a problem with this, you know, gain one life for each creature that you control or gain X amount of life for each creature you control. The issue I have with that is if you have enough to gain, like, six life off of this, you're probably already winning the game anyway. You know, just win more at that point. There are some points in the game, though, where this can be effectively used as removal during your opponent's turn. Control decks might want it. Tokens decks might want it. Any deck that wants to go wide wants this card. I will say that there's a slight non-human theme in this set, so this doesn't go well with any of those cards, but big deal. You know, instant mana or instant speed, 3 mana, easy to cast if you don't want the adamant half of it. If you do want the adamant half, it gets a little bit tougher, but two bodies on the battlefield at instant speed is always going to be decent, because even if you're not using it as a removal spell or blockers on your opponent's turn, you can always just cast it EOT, and they kind of have a form of haste, and you get to untap right away. It's almost like having a free two creatures on the battlefield. Creates two bodies. I like a lot about the spell, but mostly just in the limited environment. I'm not really sure this transcends. Another cool white card that we saw today, by the way, was Archon of Absolution. This is four mana, three and a white for a 3-2 Archon with flying and protection from white. 
Creatures can't attack you or planeswalkers you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. Now, we didn't quite get Ghostly Prison, and I woke up to some people on Twitter today being like, Got your Ghostly Prison, Dev! It's not quite, but sort of... Like, yeah, I guess I'm happy about that. This is a lot better than, like, Baird, Steward of Argive was for decks like this. The protection from white is actually pretty important. Like, against green-white tokens, for instance. I don't know what they do. They just have, like, prison... Do you have an idea, Ziggy? I'm not really sure. Like, if you never attack in with this and give them a chance to block it or anything or use a combat trick, then I'm not sure how they remove it because they have, like, prison realms and conclave tribunals and stuff. So... It seems like it would just spell disaster for a deck like Selesnia Tokens, but pretty much any white deck that's looking to attack with a bunch of creatures. This looks decent against, but again, being better than Baird doesn't necessarily make you a standard playable card. But here's a card I still have not made up my mind about. This is Drown in the Loch. This is two mana. Black and a blue for an instant. Choose one. Counter target spell with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of cards in its controller's graveyard. Or, that, I mean, if that weren't good enough for you, destroy target creature with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of cards in its controller's graveyard. Now, when I say I'm not sure about this card, I mean for standard. For modern, I think this is a very, probably a very good card. You know, the format has fetches and far more, you know, one and two mana spells people are playing. People are doing stuff really low on the curve in that format. There's decks that want to put a bunch of cards into the graveyard in modern, so it's, I think it's probably for that format. But in standard, can a card like this make it? I think so, but probably just as like a one or at the very most a two of in Demir or Esper control lists. I'm usually, I balk at cards that depend on how many cards are in your opponent's graveyard, because that's something that's a little bit more difficult to control than you might think. So, again, I have I have my foibles, I'm not too sure about drowning the Lock, but again, I do think that if anything, it's probably going to at least make a one-of appearance in the main board of Demir and Esper control lists, and that's, that's all a card has to do to be impactful. Oh crap, I didn't talk about Garen Briggs Squire. Let's bring it down. Let's bring it real low for a second, y'all. Talk about Garen Briggs Squire. Two mana, one and a green for a 2-2 two, two human soldier. And whenever you cast a creature spell that has an adventure, Garen Briggs Squire gets plus one, plus one till end of turn. Not super impressive. Limited curve filler. Sometimes it's going to be a two mana, three, three. It's okay. Most of the time it's going to be a two, two. It's not great. But let's move on here to some way better cards from the last couple of days. Let's look at Sundering Stroke real quick. This is seven mana, six and a red for a sorcery that deals seven damage divided as you choose among one, two, or three targets. If at least seven red mana was spent to cast this spell, Stroke deals seven damage to each of those permanents and or players instead. Note that the word instead actually isn't on the card. But anyway, this is what you're supposed to do with Ironclad Feet. Or Iron Crag Feet, that's the name of the card. This is what you're supposed to be doing apparently you know it's, it seems to line up pretty well to my mind you know so yeah i guess there's that it's not like it's not as exciting as i want it to be i think there are a lot of people freaking out about this when when this was when sundering stroke was spoiled like a few hours after um iron crag feet and i just i don't know i can't i can't get there i think this might be really good and it's just like a two card combo that looks okay, you know, kill three guys, you know, two creatures and a planeswalker, or kill that creature, kill that planeswalker, hit you for seven, like, it seems really good, it seems like a way for Big Red to just win the game, and there is a Big Red deck coming together, and I'm excited about that, but for some reason, I just think that this looks, this took, looks too jank to be truly dank. But, if you want to look at a good red card that I'm actually really excited for, here's Fires of Invention, or Fuegos de la Invención. This is four mana, three, and a red for an enchantment. You can only cast spells during your turn, and you can't cast more than two spells each turn. So, that's some pretty restrictive restrictions, kids. So, what uh, what's the rest of this card do? You can cast spells with converted mana costs less than or equal to the amount of land you control without paying their mana costs. All right, so no tricks at instant speed and no going off, you know, no storming off, no comboing that requires like five or six spells in one turn. That's fine, That's fine, Chief. You're still effectively getting a free spell like every single turn, and that's really, it's very, it's quite good. It really, really is. You know, this reminded me of like Wilderness Reclamation, only it works the opposite way. You know, Wilderness Reclamation, you can more or less like only cast stuff at instant speed if you want to get the double mana production out of it. I mean, I guess you can cast sorcery speed stuff on your turn and then instant speed stuff on your opponents. That does work, but 
The way this works is you can never cast anything on your opponent's turn, but you kind of get double mana on your turn. Like, if you have four lands, you can't cast an eight mana thing, but you can cast two four mana things, and you couldn't have done that before, Jack. That seems really, really nice. And I like that it's not, like, it's never a do-nothing enchantment. Like, you can play it on turn four, and then play a four drop. Or less, even, you know, play a three drop, a gruel spellbreaker, whatever. That's really nice. I think this probably has to be better than Experimental Frenzy, and I ain't sure that it is, but completely different kind of decks want it. And Experimental Frenzy is going to be in decks with a lot of, like, one and two drops can blow through really quick. It wants to play a bunch of spells in one turn. This, a little bit different, you know. This is, again, good for big red decks that have big red cards and want to get, you know... <laughs> basically double mana on each of their turns and you can you know play a spell for free essentially and not tap any of your lands and then pay for activated abilities and stuff like that like Skargan Hellkite for instance and I think that might play in really really well too I'm excited about this card I think there's a lot of play on it it's gonna wrap your head around it first you know we have to figure out the rest of the cards that are gonna be in big red because it certainly looks like that kind of card but that said could be in two and three and five color decks <laughs> for that matter because at that point it really won't matter what kind of mana you have on the on the field itself you know you can just cast whatever color spells you want once you have this out so that might play in somehow too there's just a lot of different angles you can take on this card and i like it a lot but if that weren't enough for four mana red cards that are going to change the face of standard, here's Torbran, Thane of Redfell. <laughs> That's such a name. It's four mana. One and three red for a two, four legendary dwarf noble that looks like a dwarf. It basically looks like Gimli. And if a red source you control would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus two instead. That's ridiculous. <laughs> this is just the last mode on the Flame of Keld. I was really like... Sort of sad that the Flame of Kelb was rotating, even though it really doesn't see much play. It can be absolutely nuts, especially in like Cavalcade of Calamity decks. And whoo, whoo, you want a you want a card that's good in Calamity? Here you go, kid. This is really good in Calamity. And note that it's not like whenever a red spell you control deals damage. Just a red source, so creatures that attack in will also hit for extra damage. It's just a nutso card that can have a huge effect on the battlefield the turn that you drop it. Because you swing in with a bunch of small creatures, and suddenly if any of them get through, they're dealing a bunch of damage. They don't even have to get through. Note that the way this is worded, when your creatures are blocked, I mean, they deal double damage to the creatures blocking them too, so... Whoo, it's just so good. It's just so good. And yeah, it can be lava coiled, but it's still resistant to a lot of other removal in the format with the four toughness. And it's good to swing in some of the times too, again, because of the four toughness. Blocks pretty well for the same reason when you need it to, so you can get aggressive the turn you drop it. Still have a four toughness blocker if need be. So, so much I like about this. And oh, by the way, for the thousandth time, if Devotion returns in Theros, three red mana symbols in the casting cost. But we also saw a few other legendary creatures today. Here's Vorvo. <laughs> Vorvo. It's actually, excuse me, Yorvo. I got that wrong. Lord of the Garen Preserve, apparently. That's the rough translation. It's three green mana for a 0-0 zero, zero giant noble, but it ETBs with four plus one plus one counters on it. Whenever another green creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on your vote. Then, if your vote's power is greater than that creature's power, you put another plus one plus one counter on your vote. So it's like a reverse pelt collector, so it always gets a counter. I really like that. But if it's bigger than the creature rather than smaller than the creature still, then it also gets a counter. So this thing can get really big. Like you play one creature that's smaller than it and suddenly it's a 6-6. Six, six. Another creature it's an 8-8. Eight, eight. Just mmm. And by, by the time it's an 8-8, eight, eight, more or less any creature that you play is going to give it two counters. You know, when it's a 10-10, every creature you play is going to give it two counters. So it's just going to get huge. I hate that it doesn't have any keyword abilities. You know, trample would have been a really disgusting on this, but perhaps too disgusting. That said, you know, the, the mono green decks are losing both Steely Champion and Galta, and if this had Trample, this would have been a great replacement for literally both of those cards at the same time. As it is, I don't know that this is better than Steely Champion, but after a couple of turns, it's going to be a hell of a lot bigger. It just won't be 
immediately, right? So I think that that is a little bit of a problem. And not having Lionel Elves does really devalue these, you know, three mana cards like this and Lovestruck Beast. They don't look quite as good as they would in a format with Elvish Mystic or Lionel Elves. We do have the Goose that's kind of like a bad Birds of Paradise. And that could get you this on turn two. Might be worth noting. Might make the Mono Green deck good enough. But as it stands, I'm not quite sure this card actually has the chops just because of the lack of keyword abilities, the ability to kill it really easily without damage base removal at the very least. You know, like Tyrant Scorn just kills it. So I have my issues with this, but I do think it could have a, a ghost of a chance at being a standard playable card. That said, stats are never like the most important thing in the world, and stats that you have to wait multiple turns on usually aren't the best thing ever either. If this card had anything going for it other than stats, I'd like a little bit more, but I am a little bit skeptical of a card that's just stats. Right? But but again, that said, this could get big enough, fast enough that it's an important standard playable card. But let's look at another legend here that costs three mana of its respected color, and that is Linden the Steadfast Queen, finishing off this legendary cycle. This is three white mana for a 3-3 three, three legendary human noble with vigilance, and whenever a white creature you control attacks, you gain a life. That's really good for these life gain matters kind of decks. Cards that proc off a life gain like a Johnny's Pride Mate, Bloodthirsty Aerialist even, but this mostly is going to go in mono white decks. And in those decks, the best life payoffs are Johnny's Pride Mate and I guess a Johnny's Strength of the Pride because this will make it a little bit easier at least to get to that ultimate where you can zero exile a Johnny and all the creatures your opponents control after you get to that 35 life. So I think that just for that reason, this is probably going to at least attempt to see some play. And a 3 mana 3 3 Vigilance is at least decent stats in and of itself. Nothing to write home about, but at least like baseline good stats. So there's that. But... You know, it's kind of like a Sanctum Seeker that costs a little bit less, doesn't hit your opponent, but it's going to gain you a lot of life with, of course, the game. Be really good in those aggro mirrors. Not do a whole lot outside of, you know, aggro matchups. Like against control, unless you're specifically trying to grow Pride Mates, you probably don't care, but if you are playing against control, then you're going to proc kind of a lot <laughs> and get a huge Johnny's Pride Mate all at one time, so... I could actually see this being at least okay, but at the end of the day, I do have, again, I have I have my problems with it, but for the Life Gain Matters decks, this, this, this is the perfect 3-drop, you know, the best thing they could have possibly asked for, so I can't, I can't be too skeptical of it. Well, we got a new one incoming, I just checked Mythic Spoiler, and uh, this card's brand new, haven't read it before, be reading it for the first time right now, this is Sir Aitlin, the Lion's Claw, 5 mana. 3 and 2 white for a 4-4 four, four legendary human knight with first strike. And whenever it attacks, other creatures you control get plus 1, plus 1 until end of turn. It's just okay. It's just alright. <laughs> 5 mana for a 4-4 four, four first strike is, again, just okay stats, but not the best stats in the world. It can be lava coiled, whatever. And um, I do like 4 power first strikes. Those are at least okay. But, again, the stats are just that. They're just okay. They're not you know, particularly impressive. And other creatures you control getting plus one, plus one is a really nice line of text, but it's one of those cards that depends on you having a bunch of creatures on the board at the same time. And it's a five drop, so it's going to come down after Wrath effects some of the time, and I just, mm, not really sure. I feel kind of the same way about this as I felt about the five mana Red Legend um, that came out a, uh, about a four or five days ago <laughs> at this point. It just mostly looks like a Brawl Commander and not much else. But I want to close today out with a card that I missed from a few days ago because it's just not on Mythic Spoiler. I cannot find this card on Mythic Spoiler, but I saw some people talking about it on Twitter, and it turns out it's like it's on Scryfall, it's on MTG Previews, so I, I don't know what Mythic Spoiler's deal is, but I want to close out with Merchant of the Veil because I think that slyly, just a little under the radar, this might be one of the best cards we've seen in the last few days. This is three mana, two and a red for a two-three human peasant. At least the creature half is. You can pay two and a red and discard a card to draw a card. Note that it doesn't tap for that ability. Neato burrito, but what I'm really interested in here is haggle. This is just one red mana for an instant. You may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. Well, you can discard your bartered cow to this. Get a food token, but anyway. I actually really, really like this. Um, not only in standard, but possibly in modern. This looks like it's supposed to be like the replacement for Faithless Looting. <laughs> it's not as good, but you'll take it and you'll like it. It might not be as good as like Insolent Neonate in modern, but I could see a world where there's some sort of split 
between those two cards, you know, four and two one way or the other. But just because you're playing Insolent Neonate doesn't mean you can't play this. It doesn't look too bad at just one mana. And in Standard, I could see this seeing some play in either blue, red, or just mono red. Phoenix decks. You know, this card might make those things a reality just in and of, in and of itself. You know, discard your Phoenix, draw a card, only one mana for a spell that turn, getting you really close to three spells for just the one mana. I mean, this is, mm, this could be really, really nice for those decks in particular, and a horde of other combo decks or reanimator decks. Black Red Reanimator probably really likes the idea of this card. Oh, and by the way, you also just randomly get a creature. Like, I could see there being a ton of games where you play this on turn one or turn two, turn three, whatever, you know, um, and get, you know, discard your Phoenix draw a card, and then a few turns later when you're starting to run out of gas or you need a play, just play the creature. Why not? I mean, it's, it's you might as well have a creature. It's a body on the battlefield. Nothing wrong with that. And if you have extra mana, you can activate its ability more than one time in a turn, which actually seems pretty decent if you have the mana, you know? There's one thing that, you know, one thing that Phoenix decks really needed, and that was some real late-game gas, especially after they've, you know, already cast all their Jumpstart cards the second time. And this could provide that late-game gas really well, making sure they can dump, like, useless lands and stuff and get actual gas off the top and play more spells even. So I really like a lot about this card in multiple formats. And again, I think that... In sort of a sly way, a, cu a cunning way, it's it's one of the better cards possibly in the set. I know that that's a, a huge claim to make, but I think this will have impact in multiple formats, in multiple decks, and just the spell half of it is a lot better than you might think it is. But that's everything from today so far. I'm recording much earlier in the day than I usually do because I figured I'd actually try and get this video out while you're still awake. Yeah, that'd be, that seems like good business sense right there. <laughs> anyway, I think there might be a few more today. If so, I might get back on the mic a little bit later tonight, or rest assured I'll have them for you tomorrow. But make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you get all the rest of the spoilers, the decks when they come out, all that stuff. Hit the bell for the notifications to make actually sure. I don't know why it works that way, but YouTube wants you to hit two buttons to actually fully subscribe. So <laughs> make sure you're fully subscribed for all that stuff if you want to see more of my face. And if you enjoyed, well, I was going to say if you enjoyed my face in this video, but it really wasn't in this video that much. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, just hit the like button. It doesn't cost you too much. But if you did want to put a little money in the jar, then just hit the link in the description. Go over to patreon.com. A dollar a month is all I ask. Supports my content like crazy, and it allows you to vote on what decks you want to see next in the upcoming format. So give that a shot if you got the skrill. And if you want a price guide for any of the stuff that we've looked at, not only today, but all through spoiler season so far, then hit the first link in the description. Go over to Takag Player, old, old TCG player. They sponsor your boy, and they're where you're going to get all your pre-orders for the cheapest, both on boxes of packs and stuff like that, booster boxes, collector's packs and whatnot, but also on singles. And if, you do, if you're not going to order a stitch of cardboard from them, it is nice to get sort of a barometer, a price guide on what these cards are doing. So you know what to expect when they finally do come out so check out that link just clicking the link helps me out so do all that stuff and i guess i'm done for this one i'll catch you cats later i'm dead from the place thanks for watching my wizards spread love and be kind